This morning we talked about the tension between architecture and code. So we have this model code gap, we have our model of our system with components and services and layers and modules, and we have the code which basically is something different. It's all classes, interfaces, namespaces, packages. So let's look at how we can align these two worlds up now. Am I trying to merge the model and the code? And to a degree the answer is yes, but what I don't want to do is recreate model-driven architecture from 10 or 12 years ago. Does anybody remember that? It was a horrible idea. Basically, you'd, you'd get this big bloated modeling tool. You would create lots and lots and lots of pictures. You would annotate those pictures with executable UML or Java code or object constraint language. And then you would push this magic button. And then when you push this magic button, guess what happened? Your system was created magically. And when you wanted to change your system, guess what you had to do? Go back to the modeling tool and press the magic button again. It's an awful idea, so I'm not going to suggest we do that. But what I will say is this, when we're drawing these pictures, either manually or programmatically, the abstractions we, we use, we create for the diagrams, needs to reflect the code. So that's really what I'm interested in here. Now, George Fairbanks, the guy who I mentioned before, uh, he has a solution. And his solution is very simply this. We need to use an architecturally evident coding style. An architecturally evident coding style, if you've not heard of it, is simply a way to drop hints about the architectural intent into your code base. So for example, things like naming conventions. If you are creating something that's implementing a component or service, make sure that thing has the word component or service in it. Maybe you have a marker interface. Maybe you inherit from an abstract base class. Maybe you use a, an annotation or, or a C-sharp attribute. Maybe you have a packaging convention that says everything related to this one component it sits in this one folder, namespace, assembly, package. Right, stuff like this. Who does this? Right, so it's, I don't know, probably 20, 30 percent. Maybe it's still not an established kind of mainstream practice, but when you read this, it makes a lot of sense. So this morning I showed you my context my containers and my components diagram. And this is the components diagram here on the right from my tech tribe system. In the top right here, there's a tweet component. And the tweet component, very simply, it's a CRUD component. It allows you to get tweets out of a Mongo data store and put tweets in there. That's basically it, very, very simple. So how does that thing relate to my code? Well, this is my code over here loaded into IntelliJ. I have a component package, this is Java. And here are all my components. One of them is called Tweet. So what I've done here is I've, this is an example of an architecturally evident encoding style. I have a package in my code. The package relates to something on my architecture feature. Right, there's a nice, clean, one-to-one -one mapping here. Do you know why this is the case? Because I'm awesome. <laughs> awesome. There's a little bit more of a story around that. Um, the code actually did not start out that way. So the initial version of that tweet component, and in fact my entire tech tribe system, was a horizontally layered architecture. So if we take my tweet component and kind of take it apart, the initial implementation, I had a services package, and in fact all of my services were inside that package, and I had a data access package, and all of my data access objects were in that package. I'm using Java, I'm using Spring, I'm using dependency injection. So there was an interface and there was some sort of default implementation. Fairly standard approach. I see this lots in big enterprise systems. So where's my tweet component gone? It doesn't exist. There's nothing in this diagram that says tweet component. And in fact, what I really mean when I'm saying tweet component is it's a combination of the service and the data access object collaborating to fulfill a set of services. So this is a really, really nice, simple example of the model code gap. On my diagram, there's a single box called tweet component, and the code looks like that. It's different. Got two options. Option number one, redraw my picture. Can't be bothered, way too complicated, more time in Visio. Now I have twice as many boxes. Option two, refactor. So I adopted option two, and I did a really simple refactoring. I talked about a package by a layer this morning. 
And I talked about package by feature. This is a kind of hybrid approach, which I call package by component. And essentially, what I want to do is group related things together. So all of my web app controllers, I'm going to keep them separate because they are separate. They're, they're my user interface. I'm going to wrap up my service and my data access object together if they're related. Right, so it's a really, really simple refactoring. In real terms, my refactoring looks like this. So we've gone from this picture on the left to this picture on the right. So my tweet service became renamed tweet component. Basically no changes apart from moving it. That thing there, default tweet service, became this thing here, tweet component <coughs> impl. I apologize about the naming, it's equally horrible. And my Mongo DB tweet at the AO is that thing there, shifted across. Now, this is all sitting within one Java package. The interface is public. The other two classes are package protected. Do you know what this means? It can't be seen from the outside world. So what I've done here is I've basically bundled the implementation details for that tweet component into the package. In csharp.net, you do this by um, creating a separate assembly for every component um, and using the internal keyword. Right, it's the same sort of information hiding concept. Is this a silver bullet? No. Are there trade-offs? Kind of. Just to zoom into this a second first, this is uh, that screenshot again. So everything related to my tweet component sits in that package, including in this case the screen configuration file. There's my interface and I've annotated it with at components. So those who went to Cyril's talk will have seen him using annotations to represent domain concepts, uh, core concepts and domain services. I'm doing the same thing from an architecture perspective. So I'm labeling things as components if I want to treat them as a single component. So that's an, a really simple example of an architecture we have in a coding site. It's about adding metadata to our code base essentially. And there are lots of other ways we can do this. So attributes and annotations are a really lightweight way to do this. Uh, we can have a naming convention, so if you have an existing legacy code base, then maybe you want to make sure that everything adheres to a certain naming convention. Uh, namespacing and packaging is another way to do this, particularly if you use you know, C-Sharp's internal keyword or Java's um, package-protected namespace. Maven modules, so if you have a, an existing build system that's producing Maven modules, maybe each of those Maven modules is a component. OSGI. OSGI is a module bundling system for Java. Maybe each of those OSGI modules is a module. You know, it's a component that's shown in an architecture diagram. I've snuck microservices on this slide. Microservices, if you think about it, is a really nice example of an architecturally evident coding style. If we were going to draw a picture of a microservices architecture, it's basically a bunch of boxes where each box represents a single service. A single service has a nice public interface, Maybe it's messaging asynchronous, maybe it's rest and synchronous. And it has a bunch of private implementation details. Maybe inside our microservices we have some layers, we have some data access objects, maybe we store data in a separate database. It's the same concept. It's an architecture of an encoding cell. How do we get to this point? Well, the simplest advice I can give you is when you're starting out with a project with a code base, Agree on how you're going to structure your code. Agree on how you're going to look at modularity. If you want to do the horizontally layering thing, then make it very, very clear. If you want to do package by feature, make it clear. If you want to do package by component, again, put some rules and guidelines around, around what people can and can't do. Ah, testing. Yes, yeah, so I threw this out this morning, don't do unit testing. What do I mean by that? Did I really mean don't do testing? No, of course I didn't. Did you see this? A few people going, yeah. So this is a really, really fascinating paper, Why Most Unit Testing is Waste by Jim Kaplan a year or two ago. Now, if you've not read it, you should. It's a long read. Sit down for an hour, read it through. You probably won't agree with lots of this, but there are some real snippets of wisdom here, in here that I think we overlook. And if you kind of step back in time 10 years, why did we do lots of mocking? Well, imagine we're writing some code, it's talking to the database. 10 years ago, our laptops were slow, our databases were slow, we didn't have NoSQL. So one of the reasons we wanted to introduce mocks and fakes and stubs 
was to speed our tests up so we get fast feedback. Fast forward to 2015, I have a 16 gig um, MacBook Pro Retina, half terabyte SSD. I can spin up a database super quickly. I can throw data in, run some tests. So some of these reasons have kind of disappeared over time. So that's the first thing I will say there. There was a bunch of interesting follow-up content, uh, including this post by the Rails guy, DHH. He basically talks about test-induced design damage. So he's talking about Rails being this like beautiful, clean architecture, and in order to use mocks and stubs and fakes, we need to introduce lots of tests and injection points for those tests. And he basically says that corrupts the cleanliness of the Rails design. I'm not a Rails guy, so I'm going to take his word for it. But I have seen lots of Java code bases and C Sharp code bases which have been chopped up unnecessarily so that mocks can be stuffed in. And he says this, do not let your tests drive your design. Before you all jump on me, I'm not saying TDD is bad. Right, that's different. But what he's saying is don't let your tests corrupt your design, not drive your design. So, going back to my Tech Tribes code base, I've gone from the thing on the left to the thing on the right. If I look back a few years, how would have I done unit testing here? Well, if I wanted to unit test this default tweet service, what I do is I supply a mock version of my tweet data access object. That runs in memory, you know, various ways to, to, to make that happen, and basically it's very, very quick to run. How do I do mocking here? How do I test this thing in isolation? It's package protected, so I now have to jump through a few more hoops in order to you know, separate that link. It's possible we can introduce, or we could have an interface, but the reason this interface is gone is because you, in Java you can't have non-public interfaces. It's a bit of a pain. We could have a package protected abstract class which our data access object subclasses, and then we could substitute that and do dependency injection here. Kind of sounds complex. Or we could just not unit test it. Cool. So in my code base, and this is on GitHub, I don't unit test that. What I do instead is I, I test the whole thing as a black box. I test the whole thing as a component, including the link to the database. And I can do this for a bunch of reasons. Number one, it's fast. Number two, I own that whole stack. Number three, it's synchronous. So again, this isn't a silver bullet, and your context should drive you to decide the types of testing that are most appropriate for you. So what I want to say here, and this is the, this is the real message I'm, I'm trying to push out there, let's not blindly unit test everything. Right? Sometimes you're better off potentially testing bigger chunks of your code base as a structural thing, as a black box in its own right. I'm sure you've all seen this before, testing pyramid. The typical advice is do lots and lots of unit tests. And then you have a smaller number of bigger, typically much more fragile integration tests. And then if you're really lucky, you get some stuff on top. And that's the traditional advice. I worked on systems where this has been the other way around because it's been very integration heavy and there's been very little unit testing. The thing I dislike about a lot of the, the stuff we see here is purely the terminology. And I'm sure you've struggled with this yourself in the past. What's a unit? How big is a unit? For most people, a unit is implicitly a single method on a single class or maybe a couple of classes in isolation. What's integration? What are we integrating? Are we integrating components and systems or are we integrating our thing with the database thing? Right? There's lots of ambiguity here. So what I propose is this. So we still need to do lots of low level tests, but I'm going to call them class tests if I'm dealing with Java. And this is me focusing on a single method, a single class at a time. This is where we do the mocking and stubbing and faking and blah, blah, blah. Then stepping up, let's not call them integration tests, let's call them component tests if that's really what they're testing. So we write a bunch of tests, go through the public interface all the way out to the database. Again, caveat to apply, if your component is sending emails, if your component is doing something asynchronous, 
If your component is accessing a third party system you have no control over, you're still going to need to put mocks into, you know, mock out that adapter. <coughs> and then let's still have the system test on top. If you're doing microservice architectures, what are you testing? Well, you might have some class level tests inside your microservice, and you'll probably have a bunch of service tests, you know, which test your service through the public interface. It's exactly the same concept. Do you remember the terminology I used this morning? System, containers, components, classes. Do you see what I've done here? I've made the names match. That's on purpose. I want us to be able to create this ubiquitous language. I want us to be describing these things and have a really good idea of what they're testing on the code. So that's a kind of quick aside about the relationship between architecture coding and testing. Now we get onto the actual title of the opening session seven hours ago. Right, so how do we represent software architecture as code? Well, the code is really the embodiment of the architecture, isn't it? You know, we have a bunch of ideas, and hopefully the code somehow reflects those ideas. So here's an interesting question. Is the architecture actually in the code? Who thinks it is? A small number of people? Who thinks it isn't? <laughs> yeah. Let's try this out. So, this is an interesting paper from 1996 that I found. It talks about architecture description languages. And it says, in practice, architecture is embodied and recoverable from code. Do you think this is the case anymore? I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure if you look at any traditional or typical Java or C Sharp or Ruby system that you can extract the architecture model from the code. I think it's buried and hidden. So let's go back to my diagrams, the context diagram, system in the middle, stuff around it. How do we get that? How do we automatically generate that diagram from the code base? So my context diagram shows people. How do we get people from a code base? You can't. If you're building a web app and various different types of users can log in, maybe somewhere in your web app you have security configuration. So you're wrapping roles to URL parts. So maybe you can potentially scrape that information from the code to extract a list of people who use your system. But it's going to be error prone. What about the list of system dependencies? How do you get that from a code base? That's kind of hard, isn't it? If you just give me a code base to look at on GitHub, for example, could I accurately, automatically generate a list of system dependencies? Again, we can look through configuration files. We can look for known endpoints, like web API endpoints. We could look for known dependencies in the build files. But what about those horrible situations where we're building a system and it exchanges data with another system by sticking a file or an FTP share? Right, we all do that occasionally. That's really hard to kind of get from the code. So there's some information missing here. Containers. How do we get a list of containers from a code base? We could scrape Visual Studio solution files and look for web apps. We could scrape uh, Eclipse and IntelliJ project files to look for web apps. We could look for instances of public static void main. But what about people writing test harnesses as static applications? Again, this is kind of hard to extract from the code, isn't it? What about components? Can we automatically generate a component diagram from the code? Yes. If we're adopting an architecture of an encoding style, we can extract those concepts from the code. So this is actually the one thing we can get from the code if we start out creating the code in a way that's structured, like the way we think. So what I'm trying to do here is extract as much of the software architecture model as possible and supplement it with the stuff we can't get from the code. Right, that's the strategy I want to adopt here. Anybody heard of architecture description languages? Anybody using architecture description languages? No. There are a dozen, maybe 20 architecture description languages. Basically these are languages that somebody has created that you can use to model 
something about the structural elements of your system. I think the most popular one is called Darwin. Um, the documentation sits on a university web server. I've never seen anybody using it in the real world, maybe one person. So the whole architecture description language thing, it's a great idea, but it hasn't really taken off. <coughs> Who writes code here? Yeah, right, so, so let's write an architecture description language using code because that's what we're familiar with. Right, so that's the approach I'm taking. So I'm going to try and give you a little demo now. Can you still hear me? Yeah, right. So that Spring Pet Clinic system that I showed you this morning, really simple Java web app, controllers, services, and the DAO is the bottom. So I'm going to show a quick demo of how we can create an architecture model for that thing using code. So I'm going to throw in some boilerplate to start with. So what I'm going to do here is I'm basically going to create a little workspace in the model for, for just that I can use to store the architecture model. So that's been pretty boring. Next, I'm going to describe the stuff I can't easily extract from the code. So in other words, I'm going to model the software system itself, the Spring Pet Clinic system, and I'm going to model the various containers that make up that system. So here we have uh, the software system, Spring Pet Clinic. We just add that to the model, give it some information like a name and a description, and we create the person, the user. And then we simply say user.uses Spring Pet Clinic. So that's modeling basically what you see on the context diagram. Stepping down a level, um, now I've got some code that creates the various containers. So basically the Spring Pet Clinic system is a web app in Java talking to a database. So I'm going to create a web app, give it some information, and I'm going to create another container to represent the database. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the user uses the web application, and the web application uses the database. So all we're doing is we're building up a really simple domain model based upon that ubiquitous language I showed you this morning. And that's actually all we need to describe those top two levels, the context and containers level. So what about components? I don't want to go and write a whole list of components, do I? I don't want to start saying, you know, pet repository equals new component, blah, that's just super boring. So what I'm going to do instead is scrape it out of the code base. So I've got some, uh, some magic up, uh, called a component finder here, and basically all it does is you run this with the compiled version of your app on the class path, and very simply, it looks for things that are annotated with Spring's at controller, at service, and at repository. What I'm also doing to supplement that model is I'm, I'm, I'm pulling the class level documentation that's written in Java doc. So I also have access to the actual source path as well. And all I'm going to do is say, go and find all the components and pop them into the web application. So that's all the code I need to go and scrape all that stuff out of the code base. There's a little bit more uh, stuff I need to do. And I'm going to wire together the user and the database. So what I mean by that is I have a list of components in my web app. What I want to do is make the user use the controllers, the web controllers, and I want all of the data access objects, the repositories, to use the database. So that's all this code is doing here. Basically, we're finding all of these Spring and VC controllers, and we're saying make them use, uh, sorry, make the user use those Spring controllers. The same with the database. Find all the Spring repository classes, and make them use the database. What's next? Well, we need to somehow visualize this. So, I'm going to create some views, and these views basically map onto the diagrams I showed you this morning. So I'm going to create a system context view, which is very simply all software systems and all people. I'm then going to create a container view, which is all people, all software systems, all containers. And then the component diagram is very simply all components, all people, and the database. That's what I want to show on these pictures. With me so far? So that's a way to build up two things, a model in code and a set of ways to, um, a set of views to visualize that model. What do we do now? 
Well, we have all this sitting in memory, so let's dump it out as JSON because we like to JSON everything. <laughs> so, hopefully if I press the right keystroke, this will run. And there we go, look, we've got some JSON. Great. So this little framework is written in Java, it's called Structurizer for Java, and this is all open source and sitting on GitHub. Um, I'm working on a Java EE version to go and scrape out Java EE um, components with all the annotations. I have my own set of annotations I showed you before, you know, the at component. <coughs> so what this library does is it, it basically creates a bunch of rules that collapse the interface and the implementation class, and it goes and works out, it pulls those concepts out of the code base, merges them together, and then also pulls out all of the dependencies. Now, unless you guys are, are fantastic at reading JSON, we need to do something a bit more interesting. So, let me get rid of this. And let's do something else. So what I've got here is I've, I've got um, a bunch more code which basically does some styling of the various elements. And it sends it using a web API up to another tool I've built called Structurizer. So if we run this, and I hope my Wi-Fi connection is still working. Otherwise, this is going to be a short demo. Right, so that's taken that model, and it's fired it up to the app using the JSON. So if we slide over here, I'm going to need to sign in briefly. Right, this is my model. And basically, this is just visualizing that model. So the, the caveat here is you have to drag the boxes around. There's no automatic layout. So that is my context diagram. So this is all generated automatically from that code. It's simply the user using the system. It's fairly dull, but for a more interesting system, you can see how this diagram might be useful. Containers. Containers is the user using the web app, using the database. Oh, there it is. Again, fairly boring, but this is a nice, simple application. And here is the component diagram. Now, let me just drag these around for you. So there's the user at the top, the takes place at the bottom. We've got the pet repository, the vet repository, the visit repository, and the owner repository. And there's that tangling we saw before this morning. There's my clinic service. There's one of the controllers. Uh, some crash controller over there. The Vector controller, visit controller, owner controller, service. So this is the component diagram I showed you this morning. User, user uses all the various controllers. They use the clinic service, which fans out to all the various repositories. All of the naming on all of this documentation is stripped right out of the code. So we're using Java doc. And that's how I wired up the repositories to use the database. What I've also done is I've made it so you can double click the components and take you to the code. So what I'm trying to do is link up the concept of the component with something in the code. So we've got that nice transition I spoke about this morning, you know, classes to components to containers to systems. So that's my quick dem uh, code demo which all worked, thankfully. So it's a relief, isn't it? Um, so that's called Structurizer for Java. Uh, it only works for Java systems. Uh, there are a couple of different strategies. One's annotation-based, as you saw. There's also a couple of strategies for naming conventions. So if you have an existing system, you can go and extract stuff with, you know, at service, uh, sorry, star service and star component, things like that. Um, I will be putting together a .NET version in the future as well. The tool I showed you, Structurizer, uh, there's a, a free version that you can use to sign up and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and these are diagrams we showed you before. System context, containers, components. Ah. This is what happens when I fired up my own tooling against my Tech Tribes code base. So this is the component diagram for my Tech Tribes web application. Now I can explain this picture but I shouldn't have to, right? So all of these things along the side are my, my Spring MVC web controllers, and all of the stuff in the middle, these things here, these are my package by component components. Now, at the time this is generated, all of the controllers 
and therefore the web page is used to common set of components. That's why this looks really horrible. So how do we fix that? Well, this isn't just a static diagram, is it? It's a model. And since it's a model and since it's in code, we can do some stuff. We can write some more code to slice and dice and filter this model. So what you can very simply do, stuff like this. So go and find me all of these spring web app controllers. And then instead of creating one component diagram for the entire web app, let's create one component diagram per controller. So per strand of the system, per functional strand in this case. And the net result is basically this. You get a larger number of much simpler, smaller diagrams. So again, that's some of the flexibility that this gives you. It's, it's a modeling tool. It's not just drawing static pictures. Once you start to think through this, you get to the concept that Cyril was talking about this morning, living documentation, right? So all you need to do is plug this into your build process, and every time you do a commit, you can have up-to-date architecture information, up-to-date diagrams popping out of your system. I think that's really, really nice. Yay. So now we've dragged software architecture out of this fluffy, conceptual, cloudy world, and we've brought it back down to Earth. The caveat is you need to write codes to create a software architecture model. I don't think that's a bad thing. Oh, yes, what's the point of all this? Right, let's wrap up. The maintainability of a system is basically inversely proportional to the number of stuff you have. Public classes, dependencies, and I think microservices. I can see a lot of people adopting a microservices style architecture and failing with it horribly because they're just going to create this horrible rat's nest, this distributed big board of money centrally. A good architecture enables agility. Right? So if you need to adapt and flex and change your system rapidly, a good architecture lets you do that. Of course, the trick is there are lots and lots of different ways we can build systems. On the one side, on the left there, we have the traditional monolithic style of system. These are easy to build, they're quick to build, we have fantastic tooling around them. But we all know what happens, we start out with that nice clean layered architecture and it just evolves organically into the big ball of mud. You want to make a tiny change to your monolithic system, you have to make the change redeploy the whole thing. It's possible, it requires a lot of discipline. Uh, Etsy and Facebook are two fantastic examples of, of you know, big monolithic systems. On the other hand, in the other corner, we have microservices and service-based architectures. These things give you lots of flexibility, don't they? Lots of agility. Why? Because we can build them separately. We can build them with different technologies, provided we agree on the interfaces. We can scale them separately. We can substitute and replace them separately. The catch is there's more complexity here. There are more moving parts. We need to get a bit more concerned with doing some upfront design to make sure we've got our responsibilities in the right place. These are harder to refactor. The thing I love about our industry is that we're either building those or those, and there's nothing in the middle. Except there is. We can still use monolithic deployment units, and inside is a bunch of components, in-process components if you like. And that's really what my tech drive system looks like. It's a bunch of in-process components. They can't exist outside that monolith, but they have responsibilities. There are boundaries. There are internal implementation details. So we've got a modular monolith, and that's kind of sitting in the middle here. How do you know which one to pick? Agility is a quality attribute. Agility is a non-functional requirement. If you need lots of agility, go for something modular potentially microservices if that works for you. If you don't need that much agility, you know, stay on the monolithic side. It doesn't matter. Unless you want to do CV-driven design, of course. The thing is, if you can't build a structured modular monolith, don't try microservices. Adopting microservices if you can't build well-structured systems is going to really, really, really hurt you. I'll say it again. I do still see a lot of people jumping on the microservices bandwagon. And if you look at their monolithic systems, they're just a mess. And actually, sometimes I see people saying, 
we're adopting microservices because our system is a mess. You're just going to get a mess with networks in the way. Good luck with that. For me, a nice, well-defined module monolith is a really fantastic stepping stone to a microservices environment if you need the additional flexibility. So module monoliths, what am I talking about? You know, modules, component services with high cohesion, low coupling, focus on a business capability, maybe focus around a bound of context or, or, or an aggregate. These things have encapsulated data, they're substitutable, they're composable. Basically, it's the same design thinking that you need to get to a microservices architecture. What does microservices give you? Individual deployability, scalability, upgradability, polyglot programming, and so on and so forth. I really like this last week, Martin Fowler, um, uh, week four, sorry, he, he published this thing, Microservice Premium. Anybody seen it? Again, if you haven't, you should definitely go read it. It's really nice to get some pragmatic advice from microservices out there now. And he basically says, look, you might not need microservices. Again, he's talking about the same sort of things, modular modelers. Get your design thinking right. And if you, if you can justify the extra expense of going microservices, then that's when you should make that decision. So choose microservices for a reason. Choose microservices for an explicit reason. And this brings me on to my closing statements. A lot of people complain about their software being hard to work with, hard to change, hard to adapt, the code base is a mess. Right? If that's the case, you need to change it. It's within your power to change your own system. How do we do this? Think about how to align the software architecture model with the code. Think about modularity. Think about design thinking, boundaries, responsibilities. Think about adopting the architecture of encoding style. Now, the next time you start a project, and the next time you do a major enhancement to an existing code base, sit down for five minutes and explicitly think about how you're going to structure your code. What sort of principles and guidelines do you want to adopt? Is it layering by you know, feature, the horizontal layering strategy, or something else? Some actual concrete advice. Stop making every single class public. Right? That's why a lot of our systems turn into a horrible big ball of mud. Because if a class is public, it can be used from anywhere in the code base. This is really easy for me to stand up here and say. It's actually quite hard to do. So I have a challenge for you. Every time you do this, charity donation. <laughs> but public class is muscle memory. Get out of that habit. Start using the facilities of the languages you're using. If you're using Java, use package protection. If you're using C Sharp, you know, create some more assemblies. Use internal, that sort of thing. And finally, what this all boils down to is this simple point. If your software architecture model is in the code, it can be extracted from the code. What does that mean? Simpler systems, more maintainable systems, living documentation. Thank you very much again and enjoy the rest of the conference.